So I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today by Eliza Kingsford. She is a licensed therapist and mind body practitioner and author of Brain Powered Weight Loss. It's so great to have you here, Eliza. I've been looking to, forward to this for a few weeks now. Um, welcome to the show. Yay, me too. I have too. I'm so excited to be here. This is going to be fun. This is going to be really fun because I have lots of questions and we were just chatting earlier and I'm kind of thinking, where's the best place to start? So I think let's start because we have so much fun stuff to talk about. Um, in terms of, I know that your, your kind of career focus began more around weight loss. And actually, I know you've expanded out beyond that hugely now, but helping people understand, and obviously you have a whole book on this, um, and the kind of neurological and emotional side of it. So for people listening who are struggling with their weight, this is not just for people who are overweight, by the way, people that are listening, mm -hmm. everybody is struggling in mm -hmm. one form or another, right? So there's very few people who can honestly say that I am my absolute best body composition that I can be. What is holding us back? Because really that's just one example of being our best selves, right? Of being in the best shape of our lives. What is holding us back there, do you think? Well, that's a big question. Um, big place to start. You know, I think, well, it, actually the, the way you uh, introduce that is that it, it leads me to this answer. So I used to work very traditionally in a therapeutic um, perspective, uh, you know, talking through people's histories and past and, you know, what are the roadblocks and how do we overcome them and things like that. And I did that for a number of years until there was this urgency, this sort of this, this nagging um, voice in the back of my head saying, it's not quite it. We're not, we're not getting to it. It's not quite enough. And people would get, I would call it 80% better. And that just was not good enough for me. I wanted to understand what was this last 20% that was holding people back. And what I realized is that as we continue to tell ourselves our own stories, like we traditionally do in the therapeutic setting, you tell your story and you work through the story as we continue to tell ourselves the same story over and over and over again, we just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper rooted into that story. And at that time, as I was realizing those things, of course, as the universe does provide, it was, it was sort of bringing to me um, a different paradigm, a different way of looking at how we all show up in the world and how there is an opportunity for us to create from a completely different paradigm, a completely different story. And so to go back to your question about what do you think holds us back, to put it very simply, and this is a gross oversimplification, uh, we all stay stuck in our own stories, in our own patterns over and over and over again. And we repeat our own patterns throughout our entire lives in every area of our life, unless we are actively becoming aware of our stories and doing things to jump out of that paradigm and shift to a new one. So mm. that's, a, that's a big answer to that question. But, but if I'm going to oversimplify it, I would say it's that we're stuck in our own stories and patterns that just keep repeating themselves over and over. And we keep putting a bandaid on that wound. We keep saying, you know, in, in my world, we keep saying, I don't like my body. I'm going to find a diet. I'm going to fix it. And we do that over and over and over again. Meanwhile, we're still the same paradigm. We're still the same person underneath, which means we're just going to keep repeating those patterns until we fix that. Mm. It's a really good point. And it's interesting what you say as well, like when you were talking there about 80% of the results, because it's almost like people can accept a certain level of success. And this might be weight loss, it might be something else. Mm -hmm. But then they sort of hold back. It's almost like they're afraid to go that extra step, right? And, and I don't know about you, but I, what I found with people as well is there's almost this fear that, I can't have it all. Like if I'm going to have this, then I'm going to give up something else. So like, for example, it's impossible for me to be super wealthy and have an incredible family life. Mm. It's like something's got to give. Whereas there are people who uh, here in the UK, I guess the best example would be someone like the Victorian David Beckham, right? They have an amazing family life. He's an incredibly successful, was a football, you know, incredibly successful right. businessman. Right. She is successful businesswoman. They seem to have it all, but it's very rare. And most people seem to have this idea, right? That they can't have it all. One thing's got to go for them to achieve that other thing. And I don't know if you find that, but it feels like on a subconscious level that maybe we 
hold ourselves back because we have a fear of losing something else. Is that, is that fair? It is. And, and I'll go even a step further and say that you even told a beautiful story just then you told the story of why it's quote impossible to have, you know, a successful career and a, a rich family life. If that's your story, whether it's conscious or unconscious, that is exactly what you will play out in your life. And, and so the answer is yes, we do hold ourselves back, but sometimes it's, Sometimes we're aware of that and sometimes we're unaware of it. And the first step in it is it is examining our beliefs, examining um, what we believe that we're capable of. So for instance, if you're somebody who makes six figures a year and you continue to keep making six figures a year, I can tell you that that's what you believe that you are capable of making. If that is your pattern and that continues to be your pattern, then that's your belief system. And if you want to overcome that, you have to create a new paradigm to break out of it. Otherwise, you will always produce the beliefs that you have inside. In other words, we don't, we don't, we're never able to outperform our unconscious paradigms. And so if you want to know what you believe in your life, if you want to know what those unconscious paradigms are, all you have to do is look at what you have or what you don't have, because that will tell you exactly what it is that you believe. Our results are always an indicator of our belief systems. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? And it is it, it, very interesting because I read a um, book actually recently by Marissa Peer, and she was talking about about celebrities and how she'd been on a program on TV. And um, basically, they, these celebrities have been getting everything they could possibly need to lose weight. So they were given nutritionists, they were given yes. personal trainers, they were given psychologists and everything, and they lost the weight. But then when she was with them at the end of it, it was kind of like, um, they would, so they'd lose the weight and then it was like, oh, I just, I can't wait to go and eat those pancakes or whatever it was that there was yes. their weak spot. And then they yes. would come back down and they would regain the weight. And then afterwards it was kind of like, right now I need to find another diet, like you were saying. So right. it's almost like their whole paradigm is I lose weight, then it goes back on, then I need to find right. it again. And they go through this cycle right. a bit like people acquire wealth don't they and then they lose it or they kind of get so far in their career they get knocked back down almost like we have this upper limit correct um yes yes and so you explained it so beautifully you know you can give the people all of the tools right you get your psychologists and and chefs and a personal trainer that will come into your home and you can set it up perfectly but if you have not addressed the unconscious paradigm if you have not changed the person from the inside out you will always go back to those subconscious beliefs. That will always eventually bring you back to be in line with what it knows. The, the brain does not, the brain likes homeostasis. It does not like you to go outside the bounds of what it knows. And so you can temporarily override it, but it will always eventually come back to what it believes and what it knows. And so if we haven't upgraded that operating system, we haven't changed those unconscious beliefs and paradigms, it will always go back. And this is, yo-yo dieting. This is the diet cycle that most people go through. And we're talking about, you know, food and weight here, but this is anything. This is finances. This is relationships. This is careers. Um, this is, you know, money, wealth, family, all of it. And why, um, so if we look at that and you say like, you've got to create a different paradigm, then how can people do that? Because I guess that's the question, right? For people listening, they're like, right, well, that sounds amazing, but how can I actually do that? Because you're kind of changing your blueprinting really, right? 95% of what we do and think is subconscious. How do we access that subconscious thinking to actually change it and upgrade the programming if you like? Yes, um, good question. Another big question. <laughs> there are, <laughs> I mean, there are a number of steps to it. Uh, and um, let's see, I'll try and condense it for the, for the sake of this. Um, there are a number of different steps to it. And I, you know, that is what my work is all about, is walking people through each of those steps. But if I were to condense it for this and sort of oversimplify it, we first have to become aware of those paradigms. And when we say, you know, 95% is um, uh, unconscious, that's true. Uh, and so you, you might think, well, how do I know, you know, if I'm, if I'm unaware of it, if it's unconscious, how, how can I know? Well, we have this beautiful blinking light. We have this beautiful lighthouse, which is vibration, which is our energy that tells us it's a, it's a beacon that tells us um, where we are. It's, it, it tells us 
um, what is true, how we feel, uh, what is inside. So understanding vibration or energy. And if I were to simplify um, vibration, it would be, well, vibration is somewhat hard to simplify. So I'll go back just a little bit and say, at our, if you were to, to put each of our pieces of our body, pieces of our cells under a microscope that was strong enough, you would see that really at our, at our tiniest form, we are just vibrating energy. We are strings of vibrating energy throughout our whole bodies. In fact, everything is, and I won't go too woo woo into this, but everything that we think, think is solid mass is actually just strings of vibrating energy. We know that if you were to put things under a microscope. And so it stands to reason then that if we are just energy, that there's a way to work with that. There's a way to, um, address that and sort of manipulate that if we understand energy more. And this is also not new information. For instance, um, acupuncture uh, that works with the energy pathways in the body. There's you know access points to the energy pathways. The energy is always flowing and we're looking at the disruption of energy to clear that out. So once we understand that at our core, we are all just energy beings, then we can start to work with that energy and start to become aware of that energy much more in our lives. We see energy play out not only in emotions, but the physical body, the biochemical reactions in the body, any of the beautiful biohacking things that you talk about are all um, connecting to our energy, whether that's um, you know, a supplement that we take, whether that's a, um, a sauna, you know, therapeutic treatment that we do, whether that's exercise, all of that is, is working with the energy meridian pathways in the body. And so to go back to the, my original point, one of the ways that we can work with energy is to understand our vibration, understand um, the vibratory field that is out in front of us at all times. And I'll give you a, a really practical example of that. For instance, if you're upset with your husband, everybody can understand this one. If you're upset with your husband inside, you can feel that energy. You can feel your frustration and your husband comes down and says, what's wrong, everything okay? And you say, fine. So the words have said fine, but he doesn't quite believe you because your energy field is what's speaking to him. Mm. He can feel that something's not quite right, even though the words have said, I'm fine. And even if you say I'm fine in a very convincing way. You say, oh, I'm fine. He might be confused because he can feel in your energy field that things aren't quite fine. The energy field is the thing that when you walk into a room and you just are connected to somebody, that you can't really explain it, but you can feel that you want to talk to that person. You're communicating with their energy field. You're kind of drawn magnetically to them, aren't you? And then there are other people that they're almost drawn magnetically to you, but it's slightly intrusive. So you almost need to step back. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And your desire to step back, you don't exactly know why, but that's your energy field saying the way that our energy fields are communicating does not feel good to me. So I'm going to take a step back. So we all have this energy field that's there at all times. It's just, we don't always know how to work with it and we don't exactly understand it. Um, and once we start to work with the energy field, then we really understand what feels in alignment with ourselves. We can start to really tune into this is a positive vibration. This is a this is a positive reaction in my energy field versus this is a negative vibration. This is a negative reaction in my energy field. And so to really bring this down to earth in practical in practical form, let's take weight for example. When you step on the scale you can feel your energy field. If the scale reflects a number that you appreciate, you will feel a positive vibration. If the scale reflects a number you don't appreciate, you will feel a negative vibration. And from those vibrations, you will start to play out your life based on whatever vibration informed it. So if you are feeling a negative vibration when you step on the scale, what you will see most likely is that you start to run thoughts of frustration, um, um, irritation, degradation, uh, self-deprecation. Now you're, now you're frustrated. Now you're, what can I eat? What can't I eat? Um, now you're snapping at your husband. Now you're um, distracted at work. So your energy field, your reaction to that 
um, affects your choices. It, it impacts you on a very real and practical in a very real and practical way. On the flip side, if you have a positive reaction to whatever's happened on the scale, you're more um, relaxed. You're you're you have a happy vibration. Now you're you know you're you're eating in a different way. You're talking in a different way. You're relating in a different way. So. When you say, um, okay, well, how do we start to change those unconscious paradigms? One of the first two big steps are to understand your vibration and what's happening in your energy field, and then understand how it directly impacts your behaviors and the choices you make on a daily basis. So that's a long-winded explanation yeah. of two, two of the steps that we start to take. And it's interesting because when you talk about that in terms of understanding your energy field, um, I... I've been like reading quite a bit of Esther Hicks work and I think she explains this really well because yes. people might be wondering, well, how on earth do I know like whether I am, what my energy field is? And um, I'm sort of paraphrasing her here, but she talks about how when you are out of alignment with your source energy and your values and what's important to you, you are likely to feel uncomfortable emotions and that will tell you that you've gone off center is that right and, and a lot of people don't realize that do they that when they feel anger or they feel down or like you know is track back well what just happened because mm -hmm. there was a thought that sparked that like you were saying with the scales that sparked that and set off a vibration mm -hmm. and now you're out of alignment and it's very hard to attract what you want from that place right because you attract right. like right and so that's the next piece of it is and you're exactly right and and the emotions are our indicator of our energy field. So when you feel a negative emotion, you, that's, a, that's an indicator that you are out of alignment. Now, you don't have to then go try to explain it and, oh, this is why, and, um, you know, oh, this is what happened, or this is my past. You just need to understand that that negative emotion is an indicator of, in that moment, you're currently out of alignment or currently in a, what, what Esther Hicks calls an upstream vibration, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and, and what's so important to understand is that that's where you were going with this is that like does attract like. So not just from a, a sort of spiritual or, or um, metaphysical concept, but, but truly in our, in the cells in our body, like attracts like. And so as we are pointed in an upstream vibration, we are going to be attracting to us upstream experiences, upstream decisions, upstream emotions. And the more we stay in that vibration, the more we attract that to us. So to go back to the scale analogy, you get on the scale and it doesn't say what you like and now you're frustrated, you are going to keep yourself in that cycle of frustration and negative emotions based on that vibration. And that is, those are just the laws of the way that the universe works, physics works, quantum physics works, biomechanics works, is that we attract to us the energy that we put out. And so one of the biggest mistakes, especially my clients make, is that they don't like what they see. They don't like how they feel in their body. And from that place of negative energy, negative vibration, they try and make decisions. But once they understand that like attracts like, you have to understand that the only thing you're attracting is something that's going to keep you in that negative emotion and vibration. We don't find then it's very difficult, right, to actually lose the weight. And it's right. and it's really interesting, actually, because I remember going through a stage where I really wanted to. I think it was after my second child and I wanted to, I saw a personal trainer and I was trying to get back in shape and he was like, oh, what you really want to do is actually gain some muscle mass. So to do that, you're going to have to eat a lot of calories and a lot of protein and you're going to have to have carbohydrates, right? And I was like, I don't know if I feel entirely comfortable doing this, but I trusted him and I kind of gave that up and actually like it attracted exactly what I had put out there, right? So I gave up the obsession with thinking, I must eat less to get lean, to get, and, and went the opposite way and ate more. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where, you know, my husband was like, okay, that's enough now. <laughs> like we went to Mauritius and he was like, okay, that that's like, that's too lean for a woman. Yeah, like now you're kind of almost getting eight pack abs. Yeah. And isn't that crazy? Because that's the complete opposite was what right. anybody listening would expect. It would be like, well, how can you right. do that? How can you possibly increase what you're eating and expect to get into that shape? 
but part of that is the energetic process, right? I had my mind that I was set in this and I trusted the process and I've never eaten as much. Whereas you'll find that people, they cut down and then they cut down and then they cut down what they're eating. Right. And now they're just eating so little calories that it's not really supporting their energy levels at all. Right. But yet they can't lose the weight. And so how were you feeling at that time? Do you remember when you were, you said, I think you said a couple of things, you said you trusted him. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like your vibration, your energy, were you in, were you in hope and trust and excitement and faith? Um, or were you in, you know, fear and uh, trepidation? And, you know, do you remember what your energy was like when you were trying to go through this process? Yeah. So it was a difficult time because I had, I struggled with postpartum um, depression mm -hmm. at the time. But on that bit, exercise was kind of a lifeline for me. And I was sort of coming through the other side. And so I very much saw that as a way of optimizing my health. So I was putting yeah. my energy, energetically investing in that space and yes. just thinking, yes, I'm going to fuel my body in the right way. And I paid attention to it, right? I never paid so much attention to what I ate right. and how much nutrition and vegetables and protein and things <laughs> I got into me. And yeah. so I was just eating incredible amounts and got into amazing shape. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And you said some, you know, some really key words there that you were, your focus was on optimizing your health and your wellness and you were, and, and the exercise was sort of your, your lifeline almost as if um, it, well, it felt very aligned to you to be doing that exercise mm -hmm. and to be, to be nourishing your body in that way. And um, the way you described it didn't sound like you were in, you know, panic or despair, or I, I have to, I'm sure you had a desire to lose the weight, but it didn't sound like it was fueled with this sort of um, underlying sense of um, uh, holding on so tightly, I guess, maybe. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Is that, And I think that's an important component, isn't it? Is that you put something out there, like whenever I've, the, the way I guess I've always found the easiest way for me to describe when you connect with what you want to achieve and I think the women that are listening will maybe find this but easier to understand than the men is the point at which you think about conceiving a child mm. is, is can either be fraught with stress of, oh my God, am I pregnant this month? Have I, have I got pregnant? Am I going to have a baby? When right. is it going to happen? Because it's the unknown, right? But particularly That's with right. the first child, you're completely connecting with the unknown. You've never, you've got no history of ever growing a baby. So how the hell are you going to do this? You have to trust in your body. I found that when you, take steps, active steps. Okay. But you have to, there's got to be two of you to do it to fall pregnant, but then you give it up and you release it every single time. I would just fall pregnant like that because yeah. it, you've released it to the, um, to the universe in a way, right. But you've connected energetically with what you want. You're trusting that That's that right. baby is on its way to you. That's Whereas right. if you feel like I've got to get pregnant, like it's That's just right. going to be the month this month, the chances are it's never going to happen. Right. And there's many, and on the flip side, you're absolutely right. And on the flip side of that, there's many, many stories of people who, um, and uh, look, I think we can both connect to the desire to want to have a child. So the desire is okay. Um, but there's many, uh, many, many people who have, um, many stories, I should say, of people who have uh, held on really tightly and, and there's fear and desperation and what if it doesn't happen for me and sort of all the stories start to run through and, 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 um, the panic starts to run through and they, whether they adopt a child or they, you know, go about some other means um, or decide not to have a child. And as soon as they let it go, whether it's, you know, a year or six months or whatever, um, then they suddenly get pregnant or even women who were told that they couldn't get pregnant and, you know, kept trying and kept trying and kept trying and, and, and were told that it would never happen for them when they release it and let go that it, that it does happen. Now, I want to, you know, being in my profession, it's very important that I make the caveat that, um, yes, it, there are many, many women out there who who, who, who are unable to get pregnant um, currently, and I want to be, you know, really emotionally respectful there and 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 understand that you're on a difficult journey. And it is possible. Um, many, many stories of, of women getting pregnant who are told they never could because um, they let go because they released it. Mm. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And I remember when I, because I was, um, I had to have surgery and I was told I had PCOS and endometriosis. And my surgeon was like, you know, if you want to have a family, then the next six months is your best chance because it will just regrow back. And I, and, and I was in this, I was caught, like you talk about that alignment in between worlds at first, because and one half part of me was like, so scared. It's like, what you just, you just put a timer on it. You said six months, like that just feels very urgent. And then the other part of me was like, okay, well, do you know what? I'm just gonna have to give it up because if that is the way it is, there's nothing I can do, right? The only thing I can do is try and be in the right moment to make that happen. But if it doesn't happen, it, it, it's, it's not gonna happen. And I kind of just connected on that level. And fortunately then I fell pregnant very quickly, but it's not an easy thing to do. That's the thing I think. And I, I guess like, I don't know about you, the thing I found along the way in all these situations when you're trying to manifest something is that Esther Hicks is right. You the first, and what you're saying is absolutely the same. Is that the first thing is to recognize you just fell out of alignment when that discomfort in the emotion, because very much often in your heart space, isn't it? Now you're out of alignment, like something's off. Yes. Um, and recognizing that is the first step, isn't it? It is, and um, and I would back up a step almost and say that clarity is the first step. And, and I know Esther Hicks talks about it. Many people talk about the fact that it's really important to get clear about where we are going and where we want to go. Because if we're not clear about the direction in which we are going, then Joe Dispenza talks about this. We are, uh, we are by default working from our past. So the brain, mm -hmm. the brain is such a is such a brilliant machine, and it gets hundreds of thousands of pieces of information every day. And if it was able to, or if it was designed to keep all of those pieces of information, it would explode. There's too much to hold in in the brain to 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 um, to get all of these pieces of information and do something with it. So it doesn't do that. The brain filters on a daily basis. The brain filters only what we've taught it to pay attention to. This is your reticular activating system. And so the brain filters and well, how does it filter? We've learned throughout our entire lives. We have taught our brain from a, from a tiny, tiny baby by our environment, by our teachers, by our parents, by our family, by the news, by everything that we're exposed to, we teach the brain what to filter, what's important and what's not important. This is why when you decide to buy a new car and the, the new car that you want to buy is white, all of a sudden you see white cars all over the road. Mm, and you, yeah. you, know, you could think to yourself, God, did everybody just go buy a white car? This is crazy, all I'm seeing is white cars. Well, no, it's that you have made a decision about what you want. You switched on that part of your reticular activating system and you have told your reticular activating system now, this isn't, white cars are important to me. You can filter out white cars now. And so now you see white cars everywhere. They were there before. You just weren't seeing them because your brain did not look at it like it's important information. So we take that and we say, well, if the brain is constantly filtering information and it's constantly filtering information based on the messages we've given it our whole lives from the past. So past story, past story, past story. Until you have a clear picture of where you are going, your brain is only gonna bring you information that keeps, that, that it's pulling from the past because that's all it knows. That's what it's filtered up until now. So how could it get to where you're going unless it has clear information for it to pay attention to? For instance, the white car. Mm. If you just wanna buy a new car, right? Brain goes, okay, well, here's, there's cars all over the road. You didn't, you said, I want to buy this car and it's white. Now the brain says, okay, here's the white cars. So to bring this to a different example, when people say, well, I want to lose weight, right? That isn't actually giving the brain any new information. All the brain hears is wait, 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 wait. You're saying you don't want to have it, but all the brain hears is that wait is what you're focused on. And people say, well, I think I've given it the where I want to go. I want to lose 50 pounds. 50 pounds means nothing to the emotions of the body. Why do you want to lose 50 pounds? What will be different in your life at 50 pounds? What does your life look like on the other side of 50 pounds? What do you feel like on the other side of 50 pounds? That is giving your brain new information. It needs to mm -hmm. understand what it's working And now toward. you're connecting with a future self, like Connect Joe Dispenza talks. Exactly. But then what about, see, so, because I see this with people a lot, 
when like the first conversation you'll have with a client who does want to lose weight is often what I'll find is they'll say, I'll say, you know, where, where are you at the moment and where would your ideal be? And mm-hmm. often this is the response. It will be, I don't know, this pick some easy numbers. I'm 160 pounds. Yeah. And I really want to be 130, but actually, you know what? I'd be happy with 140, right? Why does that come? Like, why do we need that? Like, why can't we get to, let's go for 130 because you they've already self-limited because it's like, there's a belief and it's like, yeah, oh, you know what? Yeah, but I, I could never be a size this, right? This is not, I, you know, I'd be happy or maybe another common one you see is, yeah, but you know, it would be amazing to be in the shape I was in before I had kids, but I realize now that's not possible. Like, yeah, it is. It's possible. Right. But you haven't allowed yourself to believe that's possible, which means we're going to find that last bit impossible, right? Because we can't right. get where you don't yes. believe you can go. If you, if you don't believe, if you don't believe, if your paradigm does not hold that being at your pre-pregnancy weight is possible for you, you will always keep yourself just outside of it. Mm. Um, And we do that for so many reasons. Think of all the stories, think of all the, think of the, you know, the, um, what the media tells us happens to women after 40. Oh, it's impossible to lose weight. It's impossible to stay healthy. It's impossible to, you know, maintain your shape. Um, The media tells us it's hard to lose weight. The messages tell us it's hard to get your body back after baby. I mean, we are inundated with what we're supposed to believe and we accept that to be true and so what happens is then we repeat it back to someone like you saying um you know they'll say it out loud well i really want to be 130 and immediately there will be a belief or a paradigm that steps in and says you're not going to get to 130 don't disappoint yourself okay i'd be happy at 140 yes don't disappoint yourself but, right? but that starts with children that's what Absolutely. concerns me when i look at my kids growing up they, when is it? I would say it's around the age of nine or 10. Mm. They start to moderate. Before that, like under the eight and below, they don't have any limitations, right? They believe, you know, that they can go to the Olympics. Like my daughter would love to be an Olympic gymnast. My son used to believe he could be an Olympic swimmer. Then suddenly that gets moderated. Like it's almost like there's an age thing that kicks in as well. I don't know whether that comes from peer group because it's not always parenting, is it? I know like we all like to blame our mom and dad for all this, (laughs) everything they gave us, but in reality, it's not always justified. It's not, you're right. And I think um, as parents, there is, you know, there is, we can do a lot, but of course they go to school and they have all kinds of other inputs. Um, you know, but for instance, with, with my daughter, we, we have treated the word can't like a, almost like a bad word in our household. And every time she has said it since she's been born, we have reframed it. And, and, and we, you know, it's probably quite annoying for her and she'll probably be in some therapist's office in 20 years talking about how her parents, (laughs) that's fine. Um, she has to, she has had to reframe it every time because we don't want that in her vocabulary. So she'll say, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. And we'll say, try that again. And she'll say, I'm struggling with this right now, or I need help with this right now or whatever. And, and we've taught her from very young, you know, sort of, I can't really help it now. I know too much to not teach her these things. Um, But from very young that, if you keep saying it, that that is what will, you know, eventually show up in your life and the importance of, of minding your language and the, and the things that you say to yourself. And so um, it's more than just saying, you know, you can be anything that you want. It's, it is this um, focus on helping them understand how powerful the, their language is um, because kids do up until, well, so depending on which um, expert you listen to up until around the age of age seven, uh, their brains are developed in such a way where they are naturally in a different um, wavelength. And I believe, yeah, aren't they mostly in theta brainwave? So it's kind of slower. They're more, they're more actually in touch with the field. If you want to right. kind of get woo about it, exactly. right? Yeah. So they're more in touch with the field at that age. And so they're more creative. And they're um, at that point, that's when a lot of their belief systems and paradigms are being developed. So their belief, um, you know, they, they tell you, you hear people talk about kids who naturally think that they can 
do anything or be anything or kids who are naturally more timid or kids who are naturally more anxious or whatever. That's when that's really being developed. And that's being developed with all of their environment because they're in that different brain wavelengths. They're in that beta, they're in the, those beta waves more naturally. And from that formational period, then they start to have um, adopted messages and belief systems and core beliefs that end up informing all of their decisions and behaviors going forward. So, you know, if parents of young kids, you have this opportunity at this point to really help mold and direct um, just the shaping of that belief system, helping them understand, uh, you know, how, um, how the language you use is really important, the way that you talk to yourself. Uh, you know, another thing we've done with our, our daughter always growing up is, you know, kids are always looking for your affirmation, right? They want to know, does this look good? Did I do this right? Do you like this picture? Do you like my outfit? And, and, and while yes, I will answer her the first, the very first thing I say is, do you like it? What do you think? How do you feel about it? Right? So really getting them to understand and connect to their own alignment because what they're really looking for when they're kids is, can I, can I trust this thing that I'm feeling? I think it's this way. Do you also agree? And, and, and redirecting them back to themselves to, in that the most important thing they can do is to get in touch with what they think and how they feel. So just a couple of tips on Because it. yeah, they are, then otherwise they're looking for external validation. And it's interesting, isn't it? When you look at the research, if you look at families of that have three children, very often, the middle child, like a lot of like prime ministers have been middle children because they kind of get left. And I notice it with my three and I'm also a middle child. And at, at the time when you're growing up, you kind of think, well, I'm not the eldest and I'm not the youngest. And so where do I fit? But in reality, yeah. you have a way greater, what I love about it is you have way greater freedom because you haven't got a label. And so you often kind of like, you know, your parents have been through it already with the eldest. So they kind of know, like they're learning on the job with the first, and then they kind of hanging on to the baby of the, you know, the baby of the family. Yes. So you've got yes. that freedom to develop. And I find that it just, you see it often that child is so much more confident and so much more outgoing and also just more secure in their own viewpoint quite mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a bit of a generalization. And I think that's because they've had it's that not, freedom right, to understand. Yeah. There's good research about birth position uh, and, and, you know, the generals, the generalizations tend to be true about birth position. And it's, it is that it's that sort of, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of quote lost in the middle here, but that also allows me to turn inward and say, okay, well, I guess it's me that's going to figure out how I mm. feel and what I think. And that serves you in that way. Right. Yeah, very much so. So for, for adults that have this blueprinting, so they we kind of have worked out that they may be holding themselves back because they've now adjusted and they're like, okay, I can't get to my ideal weight or maybe I can't get the promotion I'm looking for or really achieve like, you know, success beyond their wildest dreams. How do they change that? Because if, you know, from all the reading I've done is it's kind of like, and Esther Hicks talks about this, I come back to her, but that it's all from a source of well-being. There is only a source of well-being. So when you are limiting yourself, what you're doing is shutting off that source. It's not that things are designed to work against you, it's that you've now kind of put a block for that to flow. Yeah. How can we unlock this, create this new self and allow it to flow, right? I guess yeah. that's what people are thinking. I'm sure it is. And the answer I give is not very sexy or popular, um, but the truth is once you understand how these paradigms and belief systems are really, are really driving everything in your life, to me, you want to halt everything else that you're doing and focus on that energy vibration and paradigm shifting first. And from there, then you can bring everything else back in and, and use it to help, you know, propel you forward. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is we stop doing all the things, stop doing all the things, all the diets and, and, the, and the gimmicks and the programs and the this and the that, and we, and we turn it back inward and we focus on our vibration. We focus on our blueprint, which is where we're going. We focus on repetitive action, which is the thing that 
starts to bump us off the neural pathway of that well-worn path of the thing that we know. We have to bump us off that track because the brain will always take us back to the path of least resistance. We, we actively engage in rituals and um, uh, you know, tools to become aware of and then shift those paradigms until the person that we are becoming becomes our new normal. And that becomes, it, it becomes the easiest thing. So you, you know, you, you've been studying and read a lot about vibration and, and, and things like that. And, and didn't you feel, I don't know exactly where you are in your process, didn't you feel that at some point something shifted so that now you, you can't not be aware of your vibration. You can't not be aware. Yes. Of yeah, that's true. Out of, right. Mm -hmm. And so now from that place, now you can really start creating and using all the tools and putting all the things back in that you were maybe doing before to then support where you're going. But that's where, so this is where um, the work also combines, uh, you know, uh, habit stacking and, and the way we just human behavior, the way we do things and how much energy or mental load we have to give to things. If you are, for instance, on a diet, have a personal trainer and an exercise plan and a, you know, whatever it is. And then you try and sort of add in a little bit of vibration. Oh, I heard about this vibration thing. I'm going to, I'll try that a little bit. Well, your mental load is not enough to actually create um, the shift in the vibration. This is why I'm saying we almost need to forget about everything else focus on the vibration, the paradigms and the subconscious belief drivers first, because those are the things that drive everything for all mm. of us. For me, you know, that process actually began with when I, so, and, and that's why I'm always grateful for the experiences in my life from the depression that I had, I was working with a cognitive behavioral therapist who was also a mindfulness practitioner. And she was like, well, hang on, like you, you don't get that, you know, depression is like the lowest vibration pretty much where you can't get out of bed, you don't want to face yes. the world and you're yes. thinking about taking the end of your life. So it's like, yes. well, why, why am I in that moment? What thought was it that, that did that? And then recognizing those thoughts and then questioning the truth and reality. So it was kind of like, I didn't get into the spiritual side initially at first for me, because you made a very good point there. It's almost like there's no going back when you start to recognize when you're out of alignment. And so first of all, it was kind of like, okay, well, how did that come about? And what could I offer up as an alternative thought? Because then it was like, yes. what could be the alternative to this? Right. Um, and connecting in the moment, because I found I was very much future pacing myself, right? Oh my God, it's like this, this and this, and then it's like that. And you almost catastrophizing. Absolutely. So, aren't you? And, and I think you're right. Like it's, um, you make a very good point. Like once you've connected to that, now there's no going back because every time you're off, you've recognized like, okay, I'm out of alignment here. What have you found for people who then made, got to that point? So they've now recognized when they're out of alignment and now what they're looking to do um, cause I, I, have practices that have definitely helped me, but obviously you're highly qualified in this area. What are the next steps? Is it kind of meditation affirmations? What have you found that then help to shift and move you closer to what you're trying to create? Yeah. And, and, and it's going to be different for everyone because again, it'll have to connect to their vibration, but things like meditation and meditation beyond just the sort of woo woo, it feels good, but it, it changes the brain wave that you're in, right? So you're, you know, depending on how deeply you meditate, you, you're moving from this active high beta brain wave down into the theta, sometimes delta brain waves. And that's where we access our unconscious, right? So there's a very scientifically valid reason for meditating. So meditation, um, visualization, uh, journaling, um, and then, for me personally, nature, connection to the outdoors, um, those types of things, anything that anything that that causes you to take that that deep breath, that that you know shoulders back, <sighs> relaxing. Um, so so for some people that's um, movement, some people it's walking, some people it's um, breath work. Um, all of those things tap into a different part of our psyche that is necessary for us to tap into regularly in order to create that change. But I will say um, that strangely enough, once you get into this work, you realize that less is more, right? The, the less we do, 
the um, the more we surrender, the quicker it comes. So I think for a lot of, especially really high achieving people and really, um, you know, who have lots of, of plans and goals and dreams and they want to get there quickly and they want to get there now, it's, it's all about, okay, what else can I do? What more can I put in? What else can I put on top of? And actually the opposite is, is true. The more we simplify, the more we focus, the more we surrender, the quicker it comes. Yeah, that's very, that's very true. And I think that's where Joe Dispenza, doesn't he, talks about you become more particle than wave, you become mm -hmm. more matter than because you've, you're now fo focused so hard and so intensely, you're holding on too tight, you're trying to physically make this happen, which right. people are right, it does take a long time, whereas you can kind of collapse that time space reality and draw into your experience, because you could spend it, we use like, pregnancy is an example, but you could spend three years trying to get pregnant or you get yeah. pregnant first month, right? It doesn't, right. there's no time limit on how, but I think people struggle to understand that because partly because of the way the education system is, mm. right? So yes. we kind of churned out almost as factory workers. So it's like work hard, put money away, invest it, you'll get there. Whereas in reality, people kind of attract vast quantities of wealth in a short space of time yes. when they give it up. And you see entrepreneurs are very, very good at this, but it's almost like their psyche is slightly different. Yeah, I think their psyche is slightly different. And then they train, they, you know, and, and the way they train is in these theories and in these principles, um, they train in the principles of getting laser focused on what it is that they want beyond just the, the, um, and Joe Dispenza talks about this beyond just the material form, right? So they don't get laser focused on, I want a million dollars. They get focused on what is, it, what is it that I'm contributing to people's lives? What is it that, you know, what's my soul's purpose? Where's my service? What, you know, how will a million dollars allow me to serve more people in my own unique way or whatever it is? So they get really laser focused. And then all of their attention that when you talk about collapsing that wave, all of their attention is focused on that vibration. And how quickly does that happen? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, you know, warp speed for some people. Um, but you're right. I mean, we are indoctrinated from a very young age with certain messages and certain, uh, you know, teaching of the ways of the world. Um, I remember the first time I sort of had a, this urge to, my daughter was asking for something and it came so quickly and it, before it came out of my mouth, thank goodness, I went, what are you talking about? You know, I had this urge to tell her money doesn't grow on trees and I went and I could hear it and I didn't say it and we talked about it a different way and went, wow, that was so quick. It was so indoctrinated. It was so, before I even could think about it, it was almost out of my mouth. And that's just the way that the messages that have been passed down and passed down, not to get too out there, but I do believe that we are in this age of change and that um, you know, that, that there will be a shift in the way that we think about, you know, purpose and career and the way that we create our lives and the way that we are co-creators in our lives. I, I think there are a subset of the population that already really, you know, believes this and utilizes it, but I do believe that it will become more mainstream. I don't know how quickly that will happen, but um, I do believe it will become less strange to be talking about things like energy and vibration um, mm, I agree with you I think it is because I think more and more people are talking about it and I like to talk about it I've talked about it with a few people on this podcast because I think the more that we can open up to it and I've read one really interesting guest um, Fabian Fredrickson it was very early on in the podcast who had uh, when I interviewed her she just spent some time with the Dalai Lama and she was talking about the kind of the divine feminine and how we have this sort of rebirth of feminine energy into the world. And yeah. when you think like it's feminine energy that is creationary and we need to embrace that. But I see that in uh, my boys, they're very much embracing that. And that's actually a really beautiful thing to see. Their outlook yes. is very different than the men who are now men, right? The boys that we grew up with. Um, and I think that I agree with you. I think on a kind of, energetic and also kind of feminine level there has been um, a definite opening up and I think the more that there is of that the better um, I have a question for you because I think this is um, this is like I guess difficult for people sometimes you were saying that 
whatever they do, it needs to connect with them um, energetically in terms of whether that's, and it might be that they do everything, right? They do gratitude, journaling, manifestation, visualization, everything, affirmations. Yeah. But some people do struggle with certain ones than others. So like with journaling, for example, it can be quite hard kind of to try and get those thoughts out of your head because now they're really real. They're on mm. paper, but I guess that's part of the process. For somebody who wants to experiment with journaling, um, how, how would they go about it? Is it about asking yourself questions? Is it free writing? How do you approach that? I love, yes, that's a, I think that's such a good point. And it's true, there are many people that do struggle with journaling for a number of reasons. First, understanding the story that's underneath it. Um, uh, and I think first and foremost is there's no rules about journaling. So, you know, people, one of the reasons people struggle is they'll sit down to write in their journal. What am I supposed to write? Is this right? Am I doing it right? Um, what's it supposed to look like? How long am I supposed to? Have I written enough? Am I writing in the right way? All of that we need to give ourselves space from because all of that is story. All of that is paradigm. All of that is belief. Um, and so the first thing that I have people do is, well, there's a great book called The Artist's Way, and you don't even have to read the whole book. I can just tell you that there's this, there's this um, technique called morning pages where um, she has you just write three pages in the morning of it doesn't matter what, nothing, everything, chicken scratch. Sometimes people can't even read it and just writing it. And, and um, what that does is it releases the energy that's in the body out through the spoken word. And for many people who have done morning pages, um, they'll say, I didn't even know what I was writing about for the first two weeks and going, why am I doing this? This is, you know, I'm writing, oh, I need to pick up milk at the store. I wonder if it's going to rain today. And how did I, and how is this helping me? Right. But as the practice, as the ritual of it gets cemented, then the writing started to change and it became thoughts or ideas or worries or things that were being held in the body that we didn't even realize and it starts to come out. So I'm not saying that people would necessarily have to start with morning pages, but I think the big takeaways are there's not a wrong way to journal. Um, taking the, the, um, uh, the rules off, taking that pressure off is, is a good way to start. Uh, you could start with morning pages and just write. It's called sort of free writing, just without a purpose or without a um, guidelines, that's one way to do it. And, or you can pick certain areas of your life, whether it be your body, your relationship, your career, you know, the big ones, health, wealth, relationship, career, spirituality, finances, those types of things. And pick one to write on and just, and just write, just free write. How am I feeling with it? How am I doing with it? What would I like to see? How would I like it to feel? And just see what starts to come out. I think the more we, again, surrender to the process and stop putting um, rules and obligations to what it should sound like, the more we allow the energy to come through us. Um, so that's another way to do I it. I think and that then surrender is so powerful. Like one of my favorite mantras in meditation is swaha, which I think is I surrender. It's just, it's such a powerful thing, isn't it? Yeah. And a lot of people um, understand surrender as giving up. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's the opposite. That's the, that's the power in it is that I think when people first hear surrender, they hear, well, I give up on myself or there's nothing I can do or something like that. It's almost this powerlessness. And as I've really worked with surrender and taught people to work with surrender, um, it's actually the exact opposite. Surrender is the thing that gets us out of our own way. Surrender is the thing that stops all of the messages from running through, all of the I can'ts from running through, all of the blocks that would get in our way. It, it cancels all of that out and it gives it up and says, I have so much faith that there, that, that as Esther Hicks talks about, that it's all downstream for me. It's all flowing in this beautiful direction. It's all love. It's all coming in the good way. And the only thing that blocks that is my resistance to it. So if I can just let go and hop on that inner tube and sort of roll down the stream, it, it's all going to work out in a way that will be in a positive vibration for me. And the more you can connect to that surrender, doesn't it feel beautiful? I mean, you smiled even, it's just this beautiful sort of, it's all taken care of, I'm taken care of. Um, 
so it's actually the opposite of hopelessness I, in, in, in my work. It, it feels very hopeful. It feels very comforting. Mm. Yeah, it does, especially when you connect in that way. Um, and in terms of things like affirmations, I mean, these are used by professional athletes to create what they want and they're kind of future pacing where they want to be. People struggle with this one, right? Because yeah. it's kind of like, well, how can I say, you know, that I am this when I'm nowhere close to that at the moment? Do you know what I mean? I'm so overweight right now. There's no way that I feel like I have a lean and healthy body. Yeah. How can they get there? Because sometimes what I've used is a kind of modified um, affirmation that almost indicates you're on your way there. Um, sometimes people find that more accessible. Uh, yes. What have you found works on that respect? Uh, yes, affirmations are such a hot topic um, for me and just in my personal opinion and work. Affirmations are useless unless you believe them unless you can connect to them. And so to stand in front of the mirror and say, I love my body is completely useless because your subconscious is feeling the vibration of the opposite. No, you don't, I, you know, it feels that incongruence there. It's saying, this is not, this is not true for me. And that's never going to break through just because you said it. So I love what you said about, sometimes there's almost a bridging mm -hmm. affirmation. What, and what you're doing with that is connecting to the vibratory, you're connecting to the vibration of surrender almost. You're saying, um, I don't necessarily see the path, but I believe it's possible for me, right? And so whatever that affirmation is becomes a bridge that says, um, you know, sort of I'm willing to believe or it's possible for me to, or I'm on my way to, or whatever it is. And then once that has cemented and the vibration is connected and you don't feel that, you know, people will say, I'm lying to myself. This isn't working. Um, I don't feel it. I don't believe it. It's not going to work. You can't force an affirmation through um, just because you want that to be true. I'll back up and say words are just a words are just the representation of our physical emotion. The vibration, the emotionality, is what actually changes our um, outside world. It's the it's the emotion of it that changes the matter, not the words. The words are just a symbol to tell us what we want to feel. So um, let me see if I can say that in a in a less confusing way. It's not the things that we say that matters, it's how we feel, it's the vibration that matters. The vibration is what changes, is what collapses the wave and creates the matter. It's not the things that we say. So just saying, I love my body is not the way to loving your body. If that is a symbol of you actually feeling that vibration, fantastic. If you announcing, I am wealthy in my happiest and healthiest weight, allows you to connect to the, that vibration, fantastic. That affirmation is a powerful multiplier. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't ever connect to the vibration, it doesn't work. So no, you it doesn't, you're right. Yeah. You, and anything that you're doing, unless it connects to the vibration, does it? It was funny when you were talking that, because I remember as a, a lawyer when I was six months pregnant, going mm -hmm. to an event with a bunch of um, lawyers, accountants, and other business people, and they had like a casino style night and everyone was playing poker and I'd never played it before. And I was like, you know, six months pregnant, just thinking, I don't want to be entertaining these people. I just want to be at home. <laughs> like That's all I want to yeah. do. And then I just was like, well, I can't get out of this. Right? I'm going to be in so much trouble if I just leave. So I was kind of like, I might as well give this poker a go. And then as I started to play it, it was quite fun. And mm -hmm. then I was like, hmm, having fun here. And now I'm like winning and just connected <laughs> with that winning thing. I was like, this is actually really fun. Yeah. And then in my head, I was like, I'm going to beat everyone on this table. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do it. Right. And then I did. And then it got down and the numbers got lower and lower until it was just me and one guy who's an accountant. Wow. And yeah. it was like, you know, and that's a real game of like mind trick, isn't it? It's like, and the whole, the whole crowd is now watching. Mm -hmm. And I was just you're like, six months pregnant. You're you're six winning. months pregnant. Yes, yeah, thinking this is just going to champion <laughs> women, right? <laughs> but I didn't connect with any of that. It was just fun. And I was like, I just want to beat him. I just want to because it's, yeah. I'm having fun playing it. 
Yeah. And of course, then I won it, right? Because there was no, no there was nothing in my way to stop me. There was no pressure yeah. of the crowd. There was no worrying about whether I had the right cards, yeah. whether I yeah. could mind trick him or anything. I was literally just in the spirit of fun. Yes. I was like, I've won so many of these rounds. Wouldn't it be really fun if I could just win, beat him when I'm six yeah. months pregnant? And it was just, as you say, with that surrendering of, it would just be a really fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then it happened. And it's funny, isn't it? Just sometimes you just connect in that way. And as yeah. you say, time and space just collapses and it's easy because I could have decided I've got to get better and now I've got to learn poker and I've got to learn how to manipulate it. and. But it, it wasn't like that at all. It's a really silly example, but it's just when you're in the it's moment not. and you connect with that vibration, it's so different, isn't it? It's so different. It's so different. And, and I always direct people back to examples like that because you have to connect to what it felt like for that to be easy. You have to go back to that feeling of remember what that felt like and what was missing from that, which was you know, stress and, oh my gosh, am I going to win? And what if I lose? There was none of that there. And so to connect, to anchor people back to examples like that is, is such a powerful tool. Um, yeah. And there was no pride, right? There was none of the low vibe emotions of, sure. well, if I lose, I'm going to look stupid or like, there was none of that. It was just like, wouldn't yeah. it be fun? Wouldn't it be yeah. fun to do this? What if I could just be uh. him? And that's, uh -huh. and that it sounds so counterintuitive to what we've been taught and how we've been raised, but that's what it's all about. And that's what a lot of people have the most time dropping in their lives. When I say it's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be, I mean, when you're talking about your business or your relationship or your whatever, and people want to hold on so tightly to no, it's hard work. And I have to, and I have to sacrifice this and I have to, I'm going to feel that. And they, and they want to hold on so tightly to what they've been taught about how hard things are, that it's one of the things that it's hardest for people to let go of is that it really can be fun. And people will say, no, that's just for them. That doesn't work for me. That's for somebody else. Or you give examples of it and they'll say they're the exception and whatever. Um, but I do think it's important to make the point of when you get into this work and you talk about downstream and it being fun and flow and peace, that doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to you. That doesn't mean that um, circumstances won't align that cause you know really difficult things and difficult challenges that come up in life as Esther Hicks would talk about challenges there for contrast contrast is good we want mm -hmm. contrast in our lives so it doesn't mean that we're setting ourselves up to believe that nothing bad will ever happen but if we get really good at changing these paradigms and understanding our energy and working with vibration then we are much better equipped to deal with everything that comes our way we're able to objectively look at any situation and say, okay, what is my part in this? How would I like to direct this? How would I like to choose to work with this? And what would I like to come out of it? I mean, we start asking these different questions rather than why is this happening to me? Why is this always like this? Why does this always happen in my life? How come I can never get better? Right? So, you, so it's not that, um, you know, COVID-19 wouldn't happen to somebody who is spiritually aligned. It's just that they'll deal with it differently than yeah. someone who's not. Yeah, that's very true. And I think people with that control, they, they forget that actually the more that they try and layer on, I think you made that point earlier, that stop adding in, they kind of, and, and I wanted to, before you go, talk to you because you did a whole piece with Keon about mm. um, fasting. Is that to me, for, for many people, for many women in particular, is another form of control, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. I can't have this, I can't do this, I can't eat right. in this window. And everybody knows somebody who effortlessly controls their weight, effortlessly. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. look really young, they can eat what they want. They're not actually really that anxious about it at all. And then there's other people who are like, right, okay, now I've got to do this workout every single day. Maybe now I've got to work up twice a day. Now I must start fasting and I need to compress that eating window. And it's all like just adding, 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 and cortisol's going up. Um, and it's kind of almost like then you're trying to control too much, right? And all you're hearing yourself talk is, I can't, I can't eat now. Yes. I can't have that. I yes. can't even like keto diet is a restrictive elimination yeah. diet. Um, 
what would you say? Because I know there's loads of women probably listening that are trying to do that because they feel that's all they know. And now it's like yeah. we have, we used to just have diets, but now we have all these other mechanisms that we can sure. add in. Like I'll have, you know, and, and you see it on social media, people just posting their phone, look, 20 hour fast, or I've done a two day water right. fast. But you're denying yourself hugely when you're doing this. Uh, great question. And I will bring it back to vibration in that, it's not the tool itself. And it's what I said in the Keon video as well. It's not the tool itself that's the problem. It's the way you vibrationally connect to it. So there are people who fasting um, is a surrender. It's a, oh, well, this feels, this feels good. And, um, you know, compressing my eating window works for me in my life. And I, I, I don't feel like I need to eat you know, more or more times and, and whatever, it doesn't matter the, the way that they relate to it, their energy, their vibration connects to it. It feels like flow. It feels like ease. It feels like peace. It feels like joy. It feels like it's bringing something to their lives. And then there's, a, there's another person, same thing, same eating window, same exact tool, but it feels like restriction. I can't have, I'm not allowed to, I'm not supposed to, if I do this, then I'll lose weight. And if I don't, then I won't. It's not the tool. It's, it's the way the person vibrationally connects to the tool or doesn't. And so the work is all turning inside and understanding, is that a, is that a misalignment? Is that tool just not aligned for you? Um, or is it a paradigm shift? Is it, is it because of your story? Is it because you're holding on so tightly? Is it because you haven't learned surrender? There's some work to be done internally. Anytime we're triggered by a tool, there's some work to be done internally. You should... Mm -hmm. And on the other side of that work, for instance, I'll give a personal example. Um, keto doesn't work for my body. Uh, I just, I, I've tried it before and it just doesn't, um, it doesn't, it doesn't work for my body and vibrationally, it, it's just sort of not aligned for me. But I did not feel restricted when I was doing keto. It was not about restriction. It was not, um, I'm not allowed to have, um, I'm, put, I'm setting this, self, this rule up for myself. Um, it, it was in vibrational alignment. My dad suffers from type two diabetes. And so we were doing it together to, and it actually helped heal his diabetes. He got off metformin, but for me, it didn't, it didn't work, but it was not from a place of restriction or deprivation. It was a place of misalignment. It didn't feel energetically aligned. I would be drinking my um, bulletproof coffee, which was by the way, delicious. Um, and I was in ketosis, but in my energy, my vibration on it was, this doesn't feel right for me. This doesn't feel like the right type or way of eating for my body. And I think it's really, really important for people to tease out what feels like, what feels like restriction and deprivation, which is always a story. That is always a paradigm, always a story. And what feels like misalignment. And the, the first thing we wanna do is address the story, address the paradigm um, and get people to that place where they can really listen to vibration. Anytime we're triggered like that, I can't have, I'm not allowed to have, I'm only allowed to have this. That's a story. That's a story about who knows what it is, your ability to lose weight, what will happen if you don't, how hard it's been in the past, what people told you it takes to lose weight. Those are all stories. When we strip away that story and we're able to go, you know what, what feels like downstream vibration versus upstream vibration, that's when we start to know what decisions are best for us when it comes to our health. And that is what you're talking about when you say, you know, those people who can eat whatever they want and, and never gain a pound, they're in vibrational alignment. They're not telling themselves any stories about restriction or deprivation. And even when they choose not to eat foods or even certain food groups, it's still not restriction and deprivation. It's alignment. It's, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't really eat that. It doesn't really work for me, right? That's vibrational alignment. That's what we're trying to get people to rather than this um, holding on so tightly to the feelings of restriction and deprivation. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is, as you say, alignment rather than like, I should do this. It's kind of like Tony Robbins says, stop shooting all over yourself, right? Yes. I should yes. do this. So I should, I should yeah. like bulletproof coffee. It's like, right. I don't really enjoy it. It doesn't make yeah. me feel good. I'd rather have black coffee. So I'm just going to exactly. have black coffee, even though it might be that you say all the benefits are going to help my brain. And I'm going to, you know, get into like really good concentration levels and all this. If it doesn't fit with me vibrationally, yes. there's no point in me drinking yes. it. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? Because what you're describing right there, there's so much information. 
There's mm. so much information. Well, this does this for your brain and this does this for this cell and this bot and this. And consumers are, are um, they get so many pieces of information and they're trying to filter it through the shoulds. Mm. When really we want to be filtering it through our vibration. And you just so beautifully described, you know, I don't really like the taste. And even if there's all kinds of brain health for me, I'd rather have my coffee black. That's vibration right there. Yeah. And when we get stuck in the um, story and stuck in the paradigm, you can easily feel the stress level come up. You can feel when you're stuck in your paradigm because you can feel going, well, she said I should drink this. Should I drink it? Should I not drink that? Should I take this pill? Should I be doing that? I'm not doing sauna. Am I supposed to be doing sauna? That's <laughs> yeah, what so true. Whereas when you just release it and you go like, I like my coffee black and I'm going to sit and really enjoy it. It's like, wow, this is amazing. Like yes. it just feels so nice. And then you've raised your vibration, haven't yes, you? Yes, exactly. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So I think to sum up, would it be that we need, like everybody needs to, um, they need to connect really with the alignment of themselves. We didn't even, I think we're going to have to invite you back because we didn't even get into trauma. I'm looking at questions. We didn't get into <laughs> trauma, but that's a whole yeah. nother topic. It is actually. <laughs> It's a whole different topic. Trauma informs many of our decisions, but we didn't get there today. We'll do it again. We didn't. We'll do it again. That would be amazing. What is your, um, I just want to ask you a few kind of quick questions. Yeah. What's your, what's your favorite book or it could be your favorite one to three books. I'm always asked by listeners book recommendations. Mm. What are your favorites? Good question. Um, I love Joe Dispenza. i um, breaking the habit of being yourself changed my life. Mm, um, uh, Wayne Dyer, um, wishes fulfilled changed my life as well. Hmm. And, uh, I love Neville Goddard, uh, the power of awareness, those three books just along these topics really, um, really changed my whole paradigm and how I think about the world. Amazing. I will link to those in the, uh, in the show notes. Um, please share, where can people find you? They can get your book on Amazon. It's on audible um but yeah please link so that people can kind of follow you and follow your work yeah absolutely I, I call my book sort of the level one the foundation I wrote that in 2015 and have evolved since considerably since then so that's sort of level one foundational really cognitive behavioral um, based material which is still very relevant and kind of the foundation of these pieces um, but at Eliza Kingsford everywhere really um, Instagram uh, Facebook and uh, I'm Kingsford.com is my website. So super easy to find me as long as you spell my name right. <laughs> <laughs> I will link to all of that in the show notes so people can find you and to connect with you. And thank you so much, Eliza, for coming on the show. It's been a, such a pleasure chatting to you today. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is really fun.